the reality of it Where you get the truth, where you get real Where you get to see all the things that's going on all around you That's the reality of it Where you get the truth, where you get the real Where you get to see all the things that's going on all around you That's the reality of it Where you get the truth, where you get real Where you get to see all the things that's going on all around you the reality of it, where you get the truth, where you get the real, you get to see all the things that's going on all around you, and we tell it like it is. Hey, Guido, you know my nephew back going. He sent me to the wrong place. I just saw a guy who looks like you. The guy with the big butt. He looks like that uh, Willie Mellon guy. Tell my nephew that guy is a good kid, I'm not a mess. Welcome to That's the Reality of and I'm William. And I'm Kanika. And we have a fantastic show coming up for you again this morning. So, they can't go anywhere? Nope. You cannot go anywhere until you see us again on the sofa. There with you go. some hot gas and some, some great gas. content. <laughs> Absolutely. So, we'll be right back. So, I switched my car insurance to State Farm. I say 480 bucks. You know what that is? Yeah. Don't say it. You know what it is, right? Yeah, yeah. Don't. It's a lot of dough. Switch and you could save 480 bucks with State Farm. It's a lot of dough. See if Bryant Jenkins in Reistertown can save you a lot of dough. Get to a better state. State Farm. Welcome back again to Best Reality of It. And again, my guest is Pamela Dukes. Pamela's Miracle Journey. We're just going to start calling it Miracle Journey. If you missed the first couple of segments of it, Give you a brief synopsis. She started off at the age of 12, doing alcohol, went through uh, drug addictions, hard drugs, rape, prostituting, from early age, going through 22 real, uh, rehabilitation centers, as well as a, a, a criminal record, long as this room, she said. So she's gone through it, she's experienced it, but her miracle is where she is at now with one of the largest rehabilitation centers in the state. And she does this to share her story with you so you'll know there's always light at the end of the tunnel if you want to see that light. Okay, thank you again, Pam, for coming in. Thank you for having me. And, okay, we went from the uh, area, you, had, you went to rehabilitation 22 times, you dated one of the counselors, yes. he used and abused you and he left you for? Pretty much. Pretty much just left you mm -hmm. and so where did you go at that point back into active addiction there okay. was no place else to go uh, the staff wasn't trying to hear that one of their counselors raped me or literally had so oh, you told the counselor that uh you was having an affair with yes the, uh, i told the program director okay that we were actually in a relationship okay they weren't they really again addiction now is different mm -hmm from back then um, that was back then addiction was something that was kept a secret um, nobody really we were those people you know and even now they still label addicts some people as those people mm -hmm. so when someone that's actively using drugs brings information that can be detrimental to somebody they don't look at who the message came? Don't look at who the mess. What the message is? They look at where the message came from. Mm -hmm. So this counselor was ethically, he was wrong, right? You know, um, but morally, he was also wrong because God had put him in a position to assist and empower somebody to help you. And what he did was he took advantage of my weaknesses and made it to his own benefit. And it, it sounds like I'm a victim. 
because I was a victim. I'm not I'm not in victim state anymore. Okay. But when it was actually happening, I was a victim mm -hmm. because I was very vulnerable and weak. And that's how addicts come in. We're, we're weak. We're looking for something. Some to love. Fill a void. Look, we don't for know love. what we're looking for. We're trying to fill a void that the drugs can't fill. Mm -hmm. And love is normally what's used. Mm -hmm. So that's actually what I was looking for, I thought. But what I found out was that everything that I was looking for in him, I found it in God, and I couldn't get it from anywhere else. Well, you can't get it from but man God. anyway, exactly. So after that experience, where did you go from there? I used some more. Okay. I used some more. And how long were you using after that in point? The in the process of using, I tried to kill myself. Mm. How um, did you try to kill yourself? I took a bunch of pills, mm. and I ended up in university psych ward. And um, God just, every time I tried to kill myself, he just wouldn't let me die. He had another journey for you, another purpose. Okay. I know it's hard to hear that story, even, even in your own mind. He wouldn't let you die. He wouldn't let me die. I used to walk a Tepsico Avenue, and I used to pray, and I used to ask God to encamp his angels about me mm -hmm. while I was going to do what I was doing. I didn't know what was going to happen, but I knew that the end was not going to be active addiction. And every time I tried to kill myself, he just wouldn't let me die. How many times did you try to kill yourself? I tried to kill myself three times. And mm, I'm still here. Amen. <laughs> Amen. And that's why the program is by grace. By because grace. I know it's only by the grace of God. Amen. That I'm still alive. Because I did everything that I could. To not be alive. To not be alive. Wow. Okay, well. Okay. Oh my God. Amen. Come in. Mm. See, I'm holding you, so I won't cry. I don't want them seeing tears in my eyes, right? I don't want them because you know how we go. Oh, my God. But mm. part four of this journey, we're going to continue next week, so you cannot go anywhere because it gets even heavier. Oh, God. And, it gets, and, it gets, <laughs> and the testimonial that you're going to start hearing, how God took her from here to where she is now, it's nothing but God, nothing but a miracle. Nothing but a miracle. So don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. By grace are we saved. The By Grace Counseling Center is saving the lives of people with drug addictions. It's the only program that I'm aware of in the city that, you know, will detox you off heroin and, you know what I mean? So it's a, it's a great program. The Certified Methadone Clinic. Recovering from addiction. I'm on methadone maintenance right now in the process of detoxing off the methadone. And a facility for in-house patients. But they need your help. Please send your tax-deductible donations by calling the numbers below. At Liberty Animal Clinic, they know that your pet is a member of the family and you want to make sure they are healthy and receive excellent care. Their top veterinarians and staff will treat them like family and give the best care, medical treatment, and attention you can get anywhere. Liberty Animal Clinic provides these excellent services and they are open six days a week, including giving them a complete physical and office hours are by appointment, so please call. Let your extended family join our family! Wendell Oliver Scott was an American stock car racing driver. He was the first African-American driver in NASCAR and the first African-American to win a race in the Grand National Series, NASCAR's highest level. Scott was born in Danville, Virginia, and from a boyhood, he wanted to be his own boss. He learned auto mechanics from his father, who worked as an auto mechanic for two well-to-do white families. As a child growing up, Scott was known as a daredevil for anything that had wheels. Scott was around 30 years old when he was sitting in the bleachers of local speedways watching white men race. Up to then, he had lived his whole life under the rigid rules of segregation. In 1950, he made his first attempt to enter a NASCAR-sponsored race. 
Because he had light skin, officials didn't recognize that he was black. But when he went to purchase the safety belt, they'd asked him to buy so he could drive. His race was recognized and he was told that he couldn't participate. Of course, no reason was given. In 1954, he was accepted into the NASCAR Modified Division. In those years, he honed his driving skills and began winning races. He ended up winning around 127 races in these lower divisions. In 1961, Scott debuted in the Grand National, now known as the Winston Cup, at the Spartanburg Fairgrounds in South Carolina. In the beginning of his Grand National career, he faced racism from officials, drivers, and crowds. Drivers of races would try to force him off the track. Inspectors would demand enormous repairs, like fixing chip paint before letting him race. He was once disqualified from a race because his crew was racially mixed. Sometimes he was only allowed to have his wife in the pit to help him during a race. Crowds would often jeer at him, but Scott persisted. And he finished in the top 10 five times in 1961. Even skilled drivers can be involved in accidents, and Scott had his fair share. Sometimes he was able to fix the car and get back on the track to finish the race, and sometimes even the best attempts failed. In 1973, he was involved in a multiple car pileup in Alabama. The resulting injuries nearly killed him. He survived the crash despite fracturing his ribs, pelvis, both knees, and one of his legs. He also needed 60 stitches to close up a wound in his arm. The wreck forced Scott to retire. Scott kept racing until 1973 and died in 1990. Till this day, no other African-American has won a top NASCAR race, and very few African-American drivers have gotten behind the wheel. But Scott's accomplishment has opened the doors for many others, and in January of 2015, Wendell Scott, among five others, was inducted into the NASCAR Hall of Fame. It has been 52 years since Scott won his NASCAR race at the Speedway Park in Jacksonville, Florida. And now he's rewarded for being a tough driver and a trailblazer. Wendell Scott fulfilled his destiny. And we are all proud to say that he's the first African-American to be inducted into the NASCAR Hall of Fame. And these words were spoken by Wendell Scott's son, Wendell Scott Jr. And that's why we are proud to celebrate this African-American legend here on the Talk Lounge in Five. Until next week, keep it talking. Welcome to Real Talk with Dale Cager. I have a guest with me, Kanika. Kanika. <laughs> Kanika. Yes, Dale. Last time we talked about some of the side effects mm -hmm. of breast cancer. And I gave them just a brief discussion on what happens with chemo. Yeah, oh, it's devastating. Ooh. Uh, That's difficult it, right there. It, 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 this is how I pictured when I, when I took chemo. Remember back in the day when we had Pac-Man? Yes. As one of my favorite games. Yes. <laughs> so I would use that analogy as those little, that chemo uh -huh. going through my um, veins, eating up that uh, poisonous, I mean, eating, eating up the dead cells mm -hmm. and the, and the um, contaminated cells. So that's how I pictured it back then mm -hmm. when uh, we played Pac-Man, that all of that uh, chemo was going through my body, just eating up all of those dead cells. Oh, wow. Yeah. So attacking I, it, and attacking, winning it, yeah, and yes. and and so that was a fun thing for me. So I know that was some part of um, what helped me to get through that particular session mm -hmm. when I got the chemo. Then I had to follow up radiation. Ooh, now I've heard some really bad things about radiation. Radiation, and my thoughts were that this radiation was going to burn my skin and blister the area that was targeted in my case that didn't happen so can i ask you a question so what so if you've already taken the chemo what is the purpose of the radiation in my case because the lump was so large it was uh 10 centimeters the size of a lemon mm -hmm. and it had metastasized in my lymph nodes so it potentially could have Spread gone through, through the, body. the body to other organs mm -hmm. so because it was so large and the depth of it it, it it reached to my chest wall. So the doctor wanted to make sure they got all of those dead cells off of my skin. Wow. And 
in that lymphatic system. Mm. So the radiation penetrated to my chest wall and to the lymph node area. Ooh, I know you were nervous about that. I was nervous. And, and the way they did it, mm -hmm. it was real easy. I had to lay in a cradle that shaped my body. Oh. And so I, and I couldn't move. So that cradle actually shaped my back, my body, my head. So I really couldn't move. And when the rays were penetrated to my chest wall, they had accurate mm. um, angles. Wow. If I had moved, I could have gotten my liver. Really? Yeah. Yeah, I could have gotten a liver or my heart would have been affected by the rays. Oh, that's scary. It was very scary. So, so I laid very ooh. still. Any and, side effects of that? Well, I, I the side effects was potentially the burning and the um, blistering. So I did have the burning, but I didn't blister. And I think I didn't blister because immediately after my um, treatment, mm -hmm. I put a gel pack okay. on that area. And that kind of cooled you down? Cooled it down and absorbed the heat from the rays. From the uh, radiation. And I, I believe that helped me um, from blistering. And what so, about, there's a, something, and I'm probably saying the name incorrectly, neuropathy? Is that I pronounce it right? So yes, what, what specifically is that? Well, neuropathy was the, one of the side effects from my second treatment with cancer. First time they give you a type of um, chemo, if you're re-diagnosed, you can't get the same type. Oh, interesting. I didn't read that. Can't get the same I type. Because it's not effective. Different type of cancer, right? Maybe yes, and then the, the, the can't, chemo is not as effective the second time around because mm -hmm. your your body's already been yeah. exposed to okay. that. So I had a stronger um, chemo the okay. second time around, and what that did is going through my body. It caused my fingers and toes and feet mm -hmm. to be numb. Numb. The doctor said that would go away when my treatment was over. Well, here it is. Eight years later, eight years, you still have that problem. There. I still have that problem, which means my hands and feet are constantly tingling and numb. So, what do you do for that? What do you tell another woman they could do for that? I ignore it. I keep flexing my fingers to keep the circulation, and I keep my feet um, circulated as far as um, rotating my ankles, and and I still wear my heels. Oh goodness! Yeah, I you can't wear my with heels. heels now. I I, I have, you have to continue to. living. Right. I will not let this overtake me. So how often do you have that, that, that sensation, but let's say during a 24-hour period? Nonstop. Really? Now while I'm sitting here talking. So can you still drive and those I, type of mm -hmm. things, you know? Wow. Be I still drive. I still, I still live life. I still wear my heels. There are times I can't feel my feet, but I keep moving. They're numb, tingly, even when I sleep. Mm. The sheets sometimes irritate my feet, wow. but I keep... Um, you know, just keep um, uh, resisting my ankles and, right. and, and exercise on my ankles and my hands to keep the circulation. So for <clears throat> uh, for our people who are looking, maybe this is the first time they've ever caught your segment. There are your foundation actually has different types of equipment and things that you can provide women who are going yes. through yes. Um, this ordeal. Can you share with um, everybody what those sure. types of items are? Sure. We, we provide for first we start with the moral support and then we provide pillows prosthetics, uh, financial assistance, and that financial assistance is based on whatever the um, patient deems necessary. Okay. And then, we, of course, there's screening mm -hmm. to make sure that everything is according to our form. Everything is um, submitted properly on the form. Okay. And it is verified. Okay. So, um, so that's what we provide. Okay. And sometimes we provide the wigs, hats, um, some women wear scarves. Um, we can help with other things as far as treatment. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe how, transportation if necessary. Okay. So back and forth to the doctor's appointments. So how can they get in touch with you if they're in need of any of the equipment or services that you're providing? Well, they can reach me on 443-229-6031. 443-229-6031. Or the website, Hats Off to Dale. Dot org or hats off to Dale at yahoo.com. Thank you for watching Real Talk with Dale Cager. Tune in next week for additional subjects that will be of interest to you. Thank you for your support. Did you know that one out of eight people will get breast cancer? I'm Doresa Harvey, the Midday Diva, and I'm Lolo of The Quiet Fire. The stress of this disease is compounded by the stress of their daily needs. Daily needs such as food, bras, wigs, help with utilities, rent, and treatment. 
The Dale Kaiser Hats Off Breast Cancer Foundation provides this help that is so desperately needed. But they need your help to continue. So send your tax-deductible donations to the website below or call. We can help them, but only if you help us. When quality counts, choose Comfort Temp Heating and Cooling. Right now, take $250 off any new complete heating or AC system with huge BGE rebates available on select systems. All work is guaranteed. Call Comfort Temp Heating and Cooling today for your free estimate. Welcome back to That's the Reality of It, and I am here with a very good friend of mine. He's also my doctor. And uh, you've seen him before on the show, so you know what we're going to be talking about. But it was a pleasure having you back, Doctor. Thank you very much for having me. And uh, today we want to talk about something. I, I, it's kind of personal to me as well because I have what we're going to talk about. Sure. But I was curious because when I talked with you before, and it's about diverticulosis, and uh, I had to, I had to stop, I was told to stop eating peanuts, popcorn, all the good stuff that I love to eat. And you said, why? You don't really have to do that. And I said, what? So explain. Well, your... well let me take a step back for your okay. audience who might not know what diverticuli are. Diverticuli are little outpouchings of the colon that many, in fact, 50% of people age 50 and probably three quarters of people age 75 have. And for the vast majority of people, they wouldn't know that they even have these outpouchings because the vast majority of people aren't affected by them. But there are a small minority of patients who can bleed from these outpouchings and actually potentially bleed very severely. Or they can have these outpouchings become infected, and that's called a diverticulitis. And that's appreciated as a belly pain where these outpouchings are. And that's treated with antibiotics orally, sometimes intravenously, and rarely do people actually need surgeries. As to your question mm -hmm. uh, about avoiding nuts, seeds, corn, for many, many years, patients have been told, uh, probably by gastroenterologists and still by a few of my surgical colleagues, to avoid things like nuts, seeds, popcorn, and the thoughts that these tiny little things would embed themselves in these outpouchings and possibly precipitate a diverticulitis. Which is an infection, right? Uh, right, and for the most part, that's been... Debunked. There was a large study recently of uh, actually several thousand patients. I believe this was in 2008. I was had carried around mm -hmm. in case people ask, which analyzed people who did and didn't observe this type of diet in people who had diverticular disease, and they really didn't find any difference. So, on the basis of this uh, paper, the more recent reviews, at least in the medical li literature, would say you don't necessarily have to avoid these food products. Now, my wife has diverticulosis, too, and she eats everything, mm -hmm. peanuts, popcorn. She doesn't skip any of those things that I love to eat, and she's never had an issue. Well, again, the studies would show it really doesn't make a difference. One wishes we had more control over our bodies than we right. really did do, mm -hmm. and the precipitants of either diverticular bleeding or diverticulitis they're not really quite known. We know how to treat them, diverticulitis, when it happens, but how to stop it from happening, I wish we had better answers for everyone. So do you think that um, the diverticulitis has uh, any... So based on what you're saying, people can get these diverticulitis uh, pains and infections without eating anything because my yeah. sister doesn't eat those things and she still keeps getting it. I, again, it's we're not clear what precipitates that. So, yes, one can eat, quote-unquote, bad stuff, although I just told you it's really not bad for you, uh, and not have any symptoms, and you can follow that uh, erroneous diet for as much as you want, and you can still have diverticular disease. It's kind of People with bad diverticular disease have bad diverticular disease, and those who don't, don't. So I just happen to fall in the category where I keep getting this infection, and my wife doesn't, and I want to eat those things, but I'm so paranoid. Well, right I have no problem if patients think they're they're benefiting by avoiding them. I have no problem saying, look, if, if you're doing okay, continue what you're doing. Um, and again, if people have episodes of diverticulitis, it's, it's always a question, well, how many episodes do you get before we need to do something different? And unfortunately, different is, is a surgery. 
uh, if you can isolate or you think you can isolate the area of the colon mm -hmm. that is infected, my surgical colleagues actually will remove that. It used to be this, that you had more than one episode, you went to the surgeons, were perhaps a little bit more liberal in that respect. These days, the surgeons, if they are removing the colon, you'd like to be able to, or a piece of the colon, you'd like to be able to do that uh, more electively when hopefully that surgery can be done laparoscopically through very, very, very small incisions, as opposed to an emergency surgery for diverticulitis, which if needed, sometimes requires the uh, making of a temporary, at least colostomy, only to be brought down at a later date. Okay, let's talk about that. Uh, I want to do a, a part two on this, uh, to talk about those different things that you may have to do if persons have it in a severe way or issues with it. Uh, how can they reach you, doctor? Well, uh, our office at Woodholm Gastroenterology locally is 410-602-7782. Myself, my nine partners are there. 7782? Yes, sir. All right, doctor. Hello, I appreciate you. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back because we're going to get more into the aspects of what has to be done if your diverticulosis becomes bad. So don't go anywhere. The longer you wait, the worse it gets. You think you can fix it? You're crazy. Don't go crazy. Just call A1 Plumbing and get the job done right and fast. What am I doing here anyway? A1 Plumbing is available whenever you need them, 24-7, with optional payment arrangements. I should have called that A1 Plumber. So don't wait until things get worse. Call the family and veteran-owned A1 Plumbing reliable service for all of your plumbing needs. 443-275-2381. That's the reality of it. Okay. The reality of it is that the show is coming to a close, but we'll see you again next week. Again, if you want to be a guest on the show, all you have to do is reach out to odysseyproductionshows.com. Also, if you are a musical artist or maybe a fashion stylista, and we would love to have you on the Talk Lounge in 5, and you can also email us there as well. Um, I haven't broken this news yet, so as we're leaving out and the credits are rolling, guess what? I mean, it's an Artscape! So, July 17th to the 19th is Artscape this year in Baltimore. As soon as I get my performance date, I want to see you outside jamming with me. Until next time, keep it well. <laughs> I know I didn't do Alan's like clothes. <laughs> Play God first because through him, he will make everything happen. So long. See you next time. Immediately, I think I'm in the wrong place. I mean, my cousin Immediately, that guy immediately gave me the wrong directions. Believe me, that's all, folks. The reality of it, where you get the truth, where you get real, where you get to see all the things that's going on all around you. That's the reality of it. Where you get the truth, where you get the real, where you get to see all the things that's going on all around you. That's the reality of it. Where you get the truth, where you get the real, where you get to see all the things that's going on all around you. That's the reality of it. Where you get the truth, where you get the real, where you get to see all the things that's going on all around you. And we tell it like it is.